Hi, my name's Patricia Murphy, and I am the founding editor of Superstition Review. And I thought it would be fun to do a live stream to talk a little bit about our submissions process since uh, we are closing submissions tonight at midnight. And I'd like to kind of encourage you to submit and talk a little bit about how we uh, manage submissions and the submissions process for us. So if you want to ask me any questions, feel free to put that in the chat. You can also go to our Twitter account at Superstition Rev. Um, I'm also looking at tweets on my personal Twitter, which is at Patricia C. Murphy. Um, overall, I just can't wait to talk to you. So we have been publishing for 27 issues, as you know, and we feature art. These are the submissions we take, art, fiction, poetry, and nonfiction. And we have three readers in each section. I read every single submission. Then we have a faculty advisor who reads what we call the greens and grays. So in Submittable, when an editor um, reads a submission, they put a vote on it and it's yes, no, or maybe. <laughs> a yes turns green, a maybe turns gray, and a no turns red. And so our editorial process is we do an initial screen and then anything that bubbles up into a green or a gray, which mean it, it means it has a majority yes or maybe, we meet and talk about those in person. And we have about a 5% acceptance rate, which is a lot higher than other places. Um, but that's because we only accept submissions during one month. But um, what's super important is that we're looking for um, very tight work. And so very often in our editorial sessions, we will find something that has this great voice or a, a really wonderful opening, but then the ending falls completely flat. Or uh, the, uh, there's a character that uh, is, is just off. So we're looking for pieces that are super, super, super tight and that are um, really high quality and really innovative. We want to be just surprised and delighted when we read. So I have a question over here that I'm going to uh, read to you. It's from Mercedes Laurie, who says we need an author's website to submit. And I'd love to address this question. So the form in Submittable, and you've all seen these, right? Because every editor creates the form in Submittable. In fact, if you haven't seen the back end of Submittable, there's a very robust system that allows you to change the form. And this is a big change. And we were a first adopter of Submittable. We started with Submittable in 2010. So we've been using it for 11 years. Um, and recently and and throughout the past three to three to five years really submittable has made these robust tools so that the forms are different and because we have a very limited staff so we don't have a staff to screen out um, kind of more fake submissions I have changed our form to request specific information one thing I request is an artist's website now, Mercedes, if you don't have an artist website, you can give me a Facebook page. You can give me a link to something you have written. The reason that I ask for that, I'm going to be honest with you, is because we have whole uh, groups. <laughs> okay. There's some junior high school teacher in Seoul, South Korea, who is assigning to his class to submit to Superstition Review. And we can't tell this until we get to the bio. And so in some ways, I am trying to um, make sure that people who are submitting are professionally publishing. Um, I'm trying to avoid situations where we devote a lot of time and energy to a particular submission only to find out that it was a school assignment. Or, I mean, we've even had, I, I'll be honest with you, I've had people who submitted pornography, like over and over and over. So 
Um, I just want you to think about your end user. <laughs> I'm teaching students. I really want them to be able to have a, an understanding of the professional relationship. And one of the ways that I found really works is to ask for a website. And so if, if you haven't published anything yet, or you don't have any kind of online presence, or um, I can't find you through Google, then um, that's going to make a difference in, in our editorial process. Let me check and see if I have any other questions here. I have a comment from Lee Chadwick that said, I remember wanting to submit and then reading the requirement of a high quality professional headshot and I got scared and then lost in a Sephora. <laughs> Lee, I super appreciate your sense of humor there. And gosh, you know, that isn't even, I, I have to say that's when, when we talk about a professional headshot, um, I find that there are people who submit to the magazine who have never read it. And if you've read our magazine, you know that a professional headshot is kind of our gig. So uh, we have a very um, pronounced landing page. Um, so our issue page is six very prominent professional headshots for art, events, fiction, interviews, nonfiction, poetry. And then we have a landing page for each of those categories. And so if you look at art, we do give a little bit of leeway for art because a lot of the artists will do something, um, maybe a a, mur um, a collage or um, uh, an interpretation for their headshot. But for the other pages, so nonfiction, fiction, and poetry, we're we're looking for a, a professional point of view. We're looking for uh, it, it's really part of what we do to highlight the professionalism of our authors. We celebrate our authors, not only in our issues, but on our blog, on all of our social media. And in order to do that, it makes us a lot, makes it a lot easier if we have that branding. The other thing I would say to you is that I use Superstition Review as a teaching tool. And I teach classes in literary publishing. Um, the, the, the curation of the magazine itself is a class. And I find it very important to teach my students about um, managing a brand online when you're uh, an author. Uh, one of the books that I use that we just read in my literary, publish literary publishing class is Jane Friedman's um, The Business of Being a Writer. And it talks about brand. So it talks about how you... Um, actually deal with the the promotion and product that you're uh, that you're dealing with. So let me see if I have any more questions here. Hopping over to Instagram. I hope you're following our Instagram account. My student this semester who is my social media uh, is just doing amazing work on our um, our socials. Uh, and in fact, we just passed 10K followers on Twitter. We're so excited. Um, so let's see if we have any other questions. Okay. I'm gonna pop over to my Twitter account. Let's see if we have any more questions here. Okay, no other questions right now. Here's what I want to talk about um, about our uh, current submissions period. So submissions will close tonight. And let me tell you what's going to happen next. So we haven't been reading yet. We have been open for all of August. And then what's going to happen is we're going to start a very intense reading session in October. And that will be that we spend time with each and every submission that we have. So we look at uh, art. Um, we normally have the fewest submissions in art. I find that artists are less aware of, of publishing in arts journals. And so very often um, we will get several, several pieces out of open submissions that we use, but we do sometimes solicit art as well. 
but we'll review the art. I meet with my art editor tomorrow <laughs> and we'll look at the art submissions together. Then uh, in uh, fiction, that is one of our, okay, that is our third highest amount of submissions. I also find that in fiction, we tend to get the most amount of submissions that seem to be from folks who are um, emerging authors and not established authors. So when I talk about emerging towards established, this is what I talk about when I give this to my students. Um, an emerging author is going to be somebody who doesn't really have many publications, um, is maybe not um, trained in an MFA program or hasn't really done any online workshops, things like that. All, and I call that a level one, all the way up to a level 10, which is what I call an established author. And that's going to be somebody, I'm going to use the example David Lazar because we've published his work several times, right? Um, he's somebody who's, you know, published 20 books. He's chair of a department, <laughs> very well known. So um, we look at the continuum and we do talk about the bios. It's, it is important to us because we want to know the level of professionalism of our authors. We are creating a community where we have a range. So we go from, from one to 10 and we like to go from one to 10 in each issue. But it is something we consider and it is something that we talk about. In the literary publishing class that I teach, uh, my students were just talking about how it's uncomfortable to write a bio. And uh, the idea, uh, Jane Friedman has this wonderful discussion of writing a bio and how important it is. Uh, just as a way to um, promote yourself, really. I mean, it's a great way to promote yourself. And if you are an emerging author, you can um, talk about your interests or talk about, you know, things that you like to read that can show a level of expertise and a level of uh, um, really intellectual curiosity. What we find in fiction is we get a lot of submissions by people who are, have, have not really written a lot and have maybe not read a lot. And it's interesting to me because I find that sometimes we get a lot of submissions from people who haven't read the magazine at all. <laughs> and I can tell that right away. And it breaks my heart. It's really hard. Um, and I understand. I mean, I've been publishing for 30 years. So I'm certain that I've sent a submission to a magazine that I read maybe three or four things from. But in fiction, we tend to get people that I can tell they haven't even looked at the magazine itself. And that's a real no-no. Now, nonfiction, it's interesting because it's, um, we usually get about a hundred essays per uh, submissions period. But what's interesting about nonfiction is uh, somehow we've gotten a super, super, super duper reputation for the essays that we publish. And so we get a much more competitive batch in nonfiction. Everyone has a bio that's through the roof. Everybody has writing that is just super, super strong. So in our editorial process with nine fiction, we end up having a lot of conversations that um, <laughs> split hairs. <laughs> the same is true in poetry. So poetry is our largest uh, area. We usually get 400, 500 submissions. So that's okay. That's 2,500 poems that we read. And we get a lot of really, really wonderful poets. And we get a lot of repeat poets too, right? Um, some folks who are really dedicated and who have been so generous with us. So we like that. But in poetry as well, we end up getting uh, in our last meetings, just splitting hairs. And let me tell you how that looks. Let me tell you what October looks like. So in October, we narrow it down and uh, write the yeses bubble to the top and the three editors meet and we have arguments. <laughs> Maybe we could call them discussions. We have these discussions and we talk about, uh, we talk about the, 
what we like about a piece. We talk about our biases because even in stylistically through content um, and through uh, craft, those are the three variables that we talk about all the time. We talk about the content. What's the story? What is it? What is the aboutness? Um, we talk about crafts. So where's the beauty in it? Uh, can, how can we tell that this person is talented? There's talent. There's uh, there's just a lot of um, good ideas and strong writing. And then composition. How is it put together? Is it is it made well? Does it stick together or does it fall apart? Does it fall to pieces sometimes? So towards the end of October, we're going to have a long list <laughs> and we tend to rate, then we'll rate all three of us, the editors will rate. What are your top choices? One to 10. What is your absolute favorite piece? Then your second favorite piece. And they're all different between the editors. And so we have these conversations about why this is my favorite, why that's your favorite. And it ends up being a great way to, uh, pick the strongest work and work that appeals to a broader audience, a, a, a wider range of people. I'm going to pop into the Twitter real quick and see if we have any more questions. Okay. Let's see what we have here. All right. I'm not seeing any more questions. So um, I think that the the next thing that I'm going to talk about is I, I do want to look at our latest issue, our issue that came out in May, and just walk through it a little bit and talk about uh, how we get attracted to things. I think that might be helpful. So we're at superstitionreview.asu.edu. We also own superstitionreview.org and superstitionreview.com in case you want to find us that way. So issue 27, um, it's, it's amazing to think that uh, 13 and a half years of uh, my career have been working on this magazine. So, <laughs> well, I started it, so... <laughs> I guess not even just working on it, but um, running it. So uh, if you look at the landing page, you've got the cover. So we always make a cover each semester and we highlight one of our artists. So our art for this semester, we were so excited. So in, for instance, we have these paintings by Ali Liebgott. And if you don't know Ali Liebgott, she is one of the writers for Transparent. So um, we're so interested in representing uh, vo all kinds of voices. And that was something that I feel that felt very strongly about that she sent us some work without, without us listing. I thought that was wonderful. And then we've got photographs by Ashley Miller. So uh, paintings, photographs, and then we got these amazing fabric sculptures by Kat Babby. And this is one thing I love about uh, our art section is we get art from all over the world and uh, we get all mediums. So um, having these, I've, I've been really interested in um, fabric art lately. And so these fabric sculptures by Kat Babby just blew me away. Then we got these photographs from uh, um, a collaborative group, uh, Carolina Dutka and Valentin Sidorenko. And this was a really fascinating project. And I, was, I don't know how they found us because uh, one is Russian and one is Moldovian. <laughs> we get a lot of uh, international representation in our art section. In fact, we have photographs by Takashi Arya, who is uh, from Kawasaki. Uh, and we also have uh, work from a Polish painter, Sylwia Karwowska. So um, 
our art area is probably our most global. We get so, and, and maybe that's because it's, it's, there's, there's no problem with translation <laughs> is part of it, but we really uh, get this rich uh, group in art. Look at our fiction section. So um, one of the things that we do also, and this is something you need to know when you submit to us as well. We do publish audio for fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. So again, sometimes I'll have people who send their work and they're like, oh, you want audio? And I'm like, oh, you haven't read the magazine? <laughs> so yeah, we publish audio for fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. So uh, in fiction, we, oh, gosh, I love editing fiction sections so much because we get such a wide variety of stories. So we have a story from Eileen Polak, um, a story by Jen Curran, Jen Michalski, Roxanne Doty, and Sarah Kabar. And all four of them are so different. Uh, really, and, and part of that is by design. I mean, part of our editorial is, and, and please know this and please internalize this. Um, we have had issues where we had five great train stories but we can't publish five great train stories. <laughs> and so an editorial constraint can just be content. Um, very often we will get two very good stories with um, a 20 year old narrator, a 20 year old female narrator, and it will feel like overlap and we don't choose both of them. And in that instance, we have, we have to set the two side by side and say, which one is accomplishing its goals better. So, um, I know that it can be, um, I, I know we wish that the process was more transparent and, and that we knew what was happening to our piece when it was in the editor's hands, but I can promise you that there are times when it really is just content. So when we're curating a fiction section, we're trying to get very different perspective, perspectives, um, represent underrepresented voices, and have storylines that are different, plots that are different, that kind of thing. And we absolutely accomplished, accomplished it in issue 27. So if you haven't read that, please do. Let's look at our nonfiction. Um, Okay, so we have a piece by Bernadette Murphy. If you haven't read Harley and Me, it's a great memoir about taking risk. We have Trifecta by Don Reno Langley, Solar Noon by Ellen Glenmore, some menu items not available. <laughs> I love going through these because I remember reading them so well and discussing them when we're in our meetings. Uh, Happy Birthday Share by James Sealar and The Coin Op by Kevin McClellan. Again, I mentioned before, our nonfiction is always so strong and we get such wonderful pieces. We, you know, we publish all types of creative nonfiction. We publish travel writing. That happens to be one of my favorites. Memoir, personal essay. We've done uh, more of, a, you know, new journalism as well. Uh, but we want a variety in each section. And so if we have, uh, I tell you what, we tend to get um, a bunch of really good pieces that are just too similar. So we may get five uh, cancer stories or we may get five mom died stories. So um, a lot of it has to do not only with the strength of the piece, but the content of the piece. Um, and I do recommend reading the issue before as you sit down to uh, submit. If, you know, one of the one of the best activities I ever performed as a, a young publishing author, this is back when I was in college as an undergrad, I was 22. Uh, is I would sit and read literary magazines. And when I found something that I just really connected with, I sent there. Um, if I didn't really connect with it, I wouldn't send. But I figured that if I had a personal connection and a real, and was really drawn to uh, the work that somebody was publishing, that maybe my voice would fit in as well. 
And so I absolutely recommend that if you're going to send nonfiction, go back and read issue 27, read issue 26. You can even go to our archives page. We have a great archives page and you just look through and find the names that uh, pop out to you and hop in and see what we've published. That's the best way you can target a particular market. I would say you have to set a timer and do that for everybody you submit to. If you're sending without reading, it's a waste of everybody's time. So I want to look at poetry for issue 27. Let's take a look. Okay, hold on one second. Typo poetry. All right, Kelsey Dingman. <laughs> she is so lovely and she sends to us all the time. We've got David Greenspan, Jennifer Met, an amazing piece by JSA Lowe. JSA Lowe. If you haven't read this, absolutely pop in and read it. Just I remember this coming uh, coming through and I there are very rare times where something will come in and I'm just a yes immediately. And you know, I you an, uh, an editor can tell when you send your A work and when you send your B work. <laughs> and I say that because I, I have A work and B work and I'm sending it out all the time. Um, but, oh my gosh, I tell you what, when I got this poem, I, I thought, I feel so lucky that she sent this work to me because it was just stunning. So I think your goal is to make ed every editor feel that way. <laughs> We've got Lori uh, Sorborn, uh, Lucy Zhang, Martha Solano, Olation Humble, uh, Robert Crutt, Sarah Moore Wagner, Sacha Dash, and Thomas Nieto. Again, we're trying to represent a wide range of voices and a lot of different variety and style. Um, there's, there's really a lot going on there. Okay, I'm going to check Twitter real quick and see if anybody's got a question for me. Okay. Lee said, I also don't have an author website, though I have a link tree, which I was super impressed with myself for creating. <laughs> um, those guidelines are wild. Why did anyone give me a book contract? Those fools. I don't know link tree. Let's take a look. What is link tree? Is it uh, something? Is it like a all links, all your links in one place? Okay. That's fine. I'll take that. And again, the we, the purpose is, I mean, we Google everybody we publish and you know why, right? I mean, with all of the controversy of, about people publishing under fake names and we just had it happen in issue 27. Somebody sent us something um, with the name, he, he sent it in the name of an Asian woman and he was a white man. I mean, it happens every day. And so um, one of the reasons that that we Google everybody and we want to see a history is we're a university publication and we're training students. Uh, we can't risk getting caught in one of these situations where we're publishing somebody who's misrepresenting themselves. Um, so yes, that works for me, Lee. I'm happy to look at anything you have that helps me get a picture of you as a, as an author. Um, you know, I, I did a, um, Korean poetry work, manuscript workshop. Have you ever heard of those with Jane, Joan Houlihan? They're really wonderful. And an editor there, um, the editor from Tupelo said with, that when they're, they're choosing an author or when they're choosing a prize winner in their poetry book contest, they do look at the acknowledgement page and they want to see that you have published some of your poems in other places before they take you on as an author. And the reason is that they don't have a huge staff to market. And so they're looking for somebody who has done their due diligence of publishing their work and promoting their work. And I'm going to say the same is true for us. I mean, it does help us when we have somebody who is active online and sharing links and, you know, publishing in other good places and reading in other good places. So, yeah, I mean, we're a we're a professional organization. We're really looking for you to represent yourself as a professional. And 
um, you know, not every uh, literary magazine has that focus or that uh, that value, but it's a value that I hold very strongly because I'm teaching my students how to enter the literary community. And in order to do that, I need to show them what a literary community looks like. Okay, we're out of time. I'm just gonna check Twitter, Twitter one more time to see if I have a notification. But otherwise, if you have any other questions, you can always email me or actually um, sh send us a tweet at, um, at Superstition Rev or at Patricia C. Murphy. And um, I look forward to hearing from you.